It's AM 650's The Law Show, a comprehensive look at everything you need to know about the law. Now, here's Sterling Fox. Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. And welcome to The Law Show here on AM 650. Our guests in studio are both return guests from Macmillan LLP in Vancouver. A pleasure to welcome back uh, Ryan Black and Andrew Aguilar to the program. Ryan and Andrew, hello. Hello there. Hi, Sterling. Anybody want to say Happy Mother's Day to, lads? Uh, <laughs> happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Thank Mother's you. Day to my mom as well. All right. And to all the other moms. All right. There we go. There we go. And we're going to talk today about the new Canadian anti-spam law. Law, uh, which the government is calling the Canada's Law on Spam and Other Electronic Threats. That's actually only the partial name of the law. <laughs> Ryan was saying just before we went on, this law has 55 uh, words Close to, to, that. to yeah, describe it. And the word spam is not in it once. No. Uh, the act kind of begins with an act to promote the digital economy, and it goes on and on for a while. They couldn't actually agree on a, on a full title, on a short title for it. Right. When does the new anti spam law? law come into effect, Andrew? Uh, July 1st, 2014. So it's just around the corner. Okay. All right. Now, what's... uh, But this has been actually in the works for a few years, hasn't it? For many years. uh, The the task force that started this law was back in 2004, so we're almost a decade into this. uh, And the act act went through and was approved in uh, 2010, and it's just been, you know, two... It's been a number of years now going through to approve the regulations under the Act before it comes into effect. Okay, so now we've gone from, as I understand it, being one of the least regulated countries in the world with respect to spam on the Internet to perhaps the most regulated country on it's, Earth. Ryan, what's, yeah. what's up with it's that? It's a jump. We had, we had kind of laws that applied before privacy laws uh, might have protected someone's personal information from being used for things, but um, we were the last de- kind of developed country to come up with specific anti-spam legislation and and we've gone all in on it. Um, the the government has passed a very aggressive law with a lot of real teeth on it. Andrew, if, for, just for the sake of, of uh, the defining the word, spam is electronic junk mail, isn't it? I think so. It's a message you don't want to receive and usually has some type of commercial purpose. Someone's trying to get some type of benefit out of it. Okay, so now, Ryan, what will Canada's new anti-spam law do? Well, I mean, it. Uh, I think a lot of people would have approached the the topic by stopping, you know, by starting with defining what spam is and saying, okay, you can't spam anymore. Okay. Uh, what the government has done instead is is started a law that basically says you can't send emails with a commercial purpose unless. So every email that has a commercial purpose is potentially caught by this law, and that's whether you're, you know, selling your exercise bike or whether you're a giant telecommunications company sending out millions of messages a day. Um, it, it starts from the proposition that you shouldn't be sending out commercial electronic messages unless the person who receives it actually told you they want to receive it okay. or did something that implied that they, they would want you to receive it. Okay. Now, Andrew, if you don't mind, back to, back to my rudimentary definition of spam using the junk mail metaphor. Yeah. Uh, will advertisers simultaneously be prohibited from distributing flyers to your mailbox as they are from sending you spam to your electronic mailbox? No, and that's what's kind of funny. Is this? It only applies to specific electronic commerce. It doesn't apply to you receiving, you know, the junk mail that you get in your actual mailbox. It doesn't apply to telephone calls that you might receive from people, and you know, and strangely enough, it also doesn't apply to things that I, you know I had talked about as having a commercial purpose. But some people might think of spam as you know that 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 uh, that chain letter that you receive or that funny forward that you don't think is quite as funny. Right, right. It's not going to stop that. Okay. Right. And that's, uh, that's a Facebook, Instagram kind of thing, isn't it? Social yeah. media, there's yeah. a lot of that funny forwarding sure. in quotes that goes yeah. on. Is that considered spam? Yeah. Um, I mean, an electronic message is actually given a very broad definition in this act. And so, you know, there's going to be a little bit of wrangling to figure out how much social media is caught by the act. But for sure, sending a message to someone over any platform, it doesn't matter whether it's email or or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, sending a message to someone could potentially be spam under this ledger. It could, could be a prohibited message. Uh, I don't use the word spam because the act doesn't use the word spam. How so. bizarre is that? <laughs> the anti-spam law doesn't use the word no. spam. So, Andrew, the enforcement dimension to all of this, uh, with July 1st, 2014, we'll have the new act about spam, not saying spam in the process. So who's going to enforce this? Do we have a new spam police we're about to hear about? Well, I think it's the same police that we've seen a lot of the ways. It's the CRTC. This is going to be an additional mandate they get with likely not a lot of additional uh, funding, 
But now, in addition to radio and everything else that they, uh, they regulate, they're going to essentially be regulating email and the Internet. Well, this is bizarre because as a person who has lived under the regulatory thumb of the CRTC for decades, uh, I recall not too many years ago, Ryan, the yeah. commission very, very publicly uh, absolving itself and washing its hands of right. anything to do with the Internet. They said quite publicly to all Canadians, we don't think we have the capability to regulate the Internet, so we're not even going to try. Right. Uh, and so this is the same outfit that is now going to be in charge of, of anti-spam? Well, I think the CRTC kind of naturally has always struggled with what their mandate is. I mean, the, you know, the act that created the CRTC and the regulations they've done over time was back, you know, in eras where radio and, and that sort of thing, I mean, the Internet wasn't really even a thought. Exactly. And and so, you know, they're, they've always been, I think, naturally struggling to find their place in the Internet world. Uh, and there's a practical aspect to it, too, which you mentioned, is that uh, it's going to be very unlikely for any Canadian regulator to stop malicious activity on the Internet when we know where those malicious activities come from, and they don't really care about Canada very much. Right, exactly. Yeah. So uh, when it comes, though, to, to July 1st, and who is likely, Andrew, to be most affected by this? The small business person just trying to make a buck or the mega corporations that send out stacks of spam every day? Well, I think the important thing is when it first comes into force, it's only going to be the CRTC. And the CRTC has publicly announced that they're going to look for the big spammers. They're going to try to, you know, they're not going to focus on mom and pop operations or something like that. Right. They're going to be looking for the people sending out a ton of messages. I think the thing that's different is three years from now, there's going to be a private right of action that comes into play where individuals can sue for spamming. And when individuals can sue, there's going to not necessarily be any type of focus and everyone's going to be fair game. Oh, okay. So, uh, but not right away, but not right down away. the road, yeah. if I continue to receive irritating, uh, e unsolicited mm -hmm. emails from people who want my money, basically, right. I will have the opportunity not only to say, I don't want to hear from you people again ever, I get to add, and if I do, I'm going to sue you. Right. Uh, well, in actual fact, your private right of action probably doesn't even start from the point where I've told them to stop me and they haven't. Um, it's it actually is a right from having received those emails uh, without giving your consent, and it's two hundred dollars a message, which you know doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that people probably receive. I, I receive in my inbox fifty or sixty spams a day at least. Right, and, uh, and a lot of people who are sent companies that are sending out a million emails or something yeah. like that. This really lends its the private right of action is going to really lend itself to a class action. So you know if someone's unhappy, they can get together with their lawyer and try to define a class of people and. Uh, and go after a company that they're unhappy with the messages they're receiving. From. With a, you know, if they send out a million messages at two hundred bucks, they've got a two hundred million dollar pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Well, right? I was just going to say now at Macmillan, you have a lot of major corporate clients, and yeah. and obviously they're quite concerned about conforming and uh, complying rather with right. uh, the new regulations. So, what sort of advice are you giving businesses, your clients, and other business people with respect to adjusting? to the new anti-spam law. I think the first thing we're telling them is this is important. There's big there's big potential penalties, a million dollars for an individual, 10 million dollars for a company. There's potentially a uh, personal liability for directors and officers of that company. So this does affect you and it's pretty important. And but importantly that there's a due diligence defense under the act. So if you made reasonable if you took reasonable steps and you've implemented a plan and you're trying to comply with it, that's a that's your best defense if someone right. sues you or the CRTC comes after you. So I guess our best advice would be, you know, this isn't something to be ignored because if you actually proactively address this law, it may be good enough to stop a lot of the liability that's coming. Ah, okay. Right. Now, in Canada, we do have something called the do not call list. You can put yourself on a list where you uh, it, uh, are no longer uh, in the target zone for unsolicited commercial phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, do we, or will we, does this act, Andrew, anticipate a do not spam list similar to the do not call list? I think it's on a different principle. The basis under this act is unless they have your consent, they shouldn't be emailing you. And it's so, a personal relationship between you and that and that business, right? So the national do not call list is literally a national list that right. everyone can check. Uh, this will be internal do not email lists, right? A business, if they don't have the consent or if someone's unsubscribed, will have to internally say, do we have permission to email this person? But Andrew, they won't be able to check with their friends. We have a chicken and the egg situation here. 
uh, they're going to have to send me an email to see whether or not I want to get more emails. Would that initial email be considered spam? Because that's they want my permission to continue sending me emails, but they're sending me an unsolicited permission, gimme, gimme email. That, that is pretty funny because under the Act, that is specifically listed as being prohibited. You can't send a message to request permission to send messages. Okay. The way you're going to have to deal with that is either get those messages out before July 1st when the Act comes into effect, uh -huh. or there's going to be a, li a certain list of implied consents where they're going to have implied consent. If you if you had done business with them, then you're going to be able to send messages to people. If you're a member of an organization, you know, if you volunteered with a charity, they can send you messages. Right, okay, yeah. okay. What about the unsubscribe? You get a lot of emails uh, and uh, from commercial sources, mm -hmm. and there's a message on there, some ad, and then right. it says at the bottom, if you do not wish to receive any further messages right. from our organization, please click unsubscribe mm -hmm. or put some, send us a return email with something in the subject line and you're off our list it's that easy so uh, will that continue to be a practice in Canada Ryan or or is it only a foreign practice help us uh, no. understand unsubscribe I, I mean I think it's always been a good business practice to do that anywhere you know you're sending out emails to people and you don't want to annoy them if you're trying to build a valuable brand absolutely so, I mean you would res you would ordinarily make it easy for people to stop receiving emails from you because you don't want to create that bad will so I think Canadian companies have been doing that I think ironically there's a lot of mistrust of the unsubscribe button from people who are receiving them, if you don't know why you're receiving a message, maybe you don't necessarily want to click on that unsubscribe because, because that, showed that, that shows that that, that email was valid. Right? I was just going to say, you see, now that's so. that's n just nasty. And yeah. a, lot of us, a lot of us are, well, you know, kind of yeah. paranoid about that sort of thing. And one of the ways that the Act tries to address that is to make sure that when you're sending out a message, you're not only identifying who you are, but where you can be contacted, and in often cases, why you're even sending the message to begin with. So um, there's, there's requirements to include your name, your address, the company name you're operating under, uh, and to, to not be false and misleading about it, you actually have to be truthful about all those things. And they've defined what an unsubscribe request is supposed to be now oh, under okay. the Act. I was going to ask you about um, that. You, it has to be clearly and prominently displayed where you can unsubscribe, and they have to unsubscribe you as soon as reasonably possible and no later than 10 days after. Okay. So it's, yeah. you know, businesses are going to really have to have their systems set up because they're going to have to be able to act on these unsubscribes right away. Right. Now, you guys both know how the bad guys work. Right. Right? And so is it, because you just mentioned this, and it clicked, you know, uh, some... Uh, ne'er-do-wells right. would send a perfectly legitimate looking advertising email mm -hmm. and 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 would use some kind of feedback device built into the email to see whether you had in fact opened it and That's read right. it and they're looking for a click a right. some kind of click right. to show contact yeah. and and would do the bad guys use unsubscribed for their own purposes that have nothing to do with your desire to never see this junk again I, I mean I think that's clearly true having unsubscribed from things and received more emails as a result um, I, I think that's absolutely true the act would prohibit that to be clear uh, the act is actually also prohibitive of sending out false and misleading messages that you know this looks like it comes from CIBC but it doesn't right um, oh, the, yeah. the act does those things to prevent that. Uh, but the reality is, is that someone sitting in, you know, a foreign country uh, is probably not even thinking about Canada when they send those messages out. They may not even know that they're sending them to Canadians. They bought a list of 100,000 people they assume are Americans, and, and they send them out, right? So they, Canada's probably not even on their radar. And that's going to be a tough part with, and that's always a tough part in enforcing spam legislation, is, you know, a lot of these, this is going to affect legitimate Canadian businesses, but when there's some, you know, some computer in some uh, foreign country yeah. where, you know, they don't expect that they're in compliance with any type of law when and they're they doing don't this, and they don't care. They right. just expect that you're not going to be able to come after them and in many countries it's probably quite legitimate that you're not going to have any chance of coming after them right. and they're going to keep sending out their 100 million messages a day and you're still going to have to deal with that with your spam filter or whatever else you're doing right now and this is why years ago the CRTC said we want nothing to do with this I mean really <laughs> I we there's can't, a practical problem <laughs> we, we can't control uh, what happens in uh, half a world away it's simply beyond our powers we can't even run the show in Canada for crying out loud <laughs> so do Canadian companies subcontract their social media advertising to offshore sources specifically to dodge that legal bullet? Well, most, like, like you know, we mentioned at the top of the show that most uh, countries in the world actually already had spam legislation by the time we came up with ours. Okay. So if they are outsourcing, they might be complying with those other uh, areas as well. But yes, they do. And uh, this act actually 
even though if you're sitting in Canada and use someone in the United States to send messages, if you're sending to Canadians or if you're using a c computer in Canada to send the messages, or if you're aiding or abetting or procuring or assisting someone in sending uh, messages, you're caught by this legislation. So even if you're bouncing it out of Vietnam or Singapore or wherever, and so, well, that's, that's, no, that's coming from offshore. And the act also differentiates the person sending the message and the person on whose behalf the message was exactly. sent. Exactly, who's paying to, to have the message sent. It applies to both of those people quite clearly. Right, okay, so that's, uh, that's interesting and it's good to know. So you can't just do an easy offshore end run, right. bounce it back, and Bob's your uncle, they can't no. touch you. I think that's an important message this act is it really sees through a lot of different schemes and is going to be very difficult to get around even if you hire an outside marketing firm to send your emails or do something like that you're going to have to still control and ensure that they're complying with the act or you know have some very strong agreements where they're promising they're going to do so or you could be in trouble how many spam adverts do you get in your email box every day i get an annoying i'm, I'm good for a dozen a day uh, and down at the office our guests get many many more than a dozen a day i'm just talking about my home email, email box isn't it annoying to say the very least we're talking about canada's new anti-spam law which comes into effect on July 1st with our guests from Macmillan LLP, Ryan Black and Andrew Aguilar are with us on The Law Show on Mother's Day on AM650 and we're back <laughs> with lots more right after this. This is AM650's The Law Show. There's more of the show still ahead.